Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Re Behind the Scenes. My name is Diana Lizarazzo and today's guest speaker is Ilona Carletti. Every Thursday I host an episode of either Re Behind the Scenes or Transformation Time. Now before we get started, I want to share some exciting news with you. I have a social networking platform that is for the real estate investing industry. So if you're a real estate investor, a mentor or a professional, you want to be a part of this platform. There's so many things in there that you want to check out that helps you transform the way you work. Never miss an event again. For example, we have a public calendar where everyone can put their events on there, their seminars, their shows, whatever. You put them on there so everyone can know what's going on and you're never going to miss an event again. Now, and one more thing, if you want to check out Elona's profile, she has set it up. You can see what her real estate strategies are, what she's up to these days. You can check everything about her on ReFam. So if you want to get on there, if you want to set up your profile too, so that people can get to know you better, get onto ReFam. The website is realestateinvestorfam.com, fam, F-A-M. Hope to see you guys there. It is up and coming and you want to be a part of it. Now let's get back to the show. On um, Re Behind the Scenes, almost forgot the name of the show. <laughs> On Re Behind the Scenes, we're going to be getting to see what project Ilona is talking about. She's going to tell us what it's about, like what the intended purpose was. We'll do some high level numbers. And the best part, we get to hear about the problems she encountered, how she solved them. And if it was something new for her, how she would deal with it next time. So if you guys are ready, let's set Ilona some thumbs up, some hearts some fire and let's get her on the stage. Oh, and I can see she's on, right? Do the test always normally, well, hopefully not now, right? Not now, taking 20 years for this to go on. Although Instagram, come on now. You gotta feel like Instagram has been long enough or lives have been long enough that um, you should be able to get it done properly, no? Should take like, seconds and like seconds i mean two to three seconds <laughs> okay let me see maybe i'm going to cancel this i'm going to cancel it and then i'm going to send you an invite elona and um let's see if that helps our situation out well, we wait for Alona to come on, though. Oh, she's there already on. <laughs> hey. Hi. How are you? It's been a while. It's fun to catch up, and I'm excited to hear about the project you're going to be talking about. It's always, always so much fun to live vicariously by other people's projects and also learn from them, right? Like, if we can now prevent these projects, uh, these problems from happening, why not, right? I know, yeah. Yeah. It's better to learn somebody else's mistakes, but I'm afraid the best mistakes are the ones that we learn by on our That's own. True. That's so true. The ones we remember the most. It is true. I feel like the the bigger the mistake you make, the bigger the learning experience, and I feel like the quicker the quicker the higher up you go. I noticed. But now before we get, because I feel like we can talk about this forever. Let's just start with telling the viewers, who are sure. you, what's your real estate journey like, anything you'd like to share before we get started talking about your project? Yeah, for sure. Um, so the last time we spoke, um, I was an investor and I'm still an investor out of Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, but I recently made a shift in my career and jumped. Uh, I'm jumping into real estate um, on full time uh, as an agent specializing in working with investors and i'm still swimming in my lane because i'll be working with projects and helping people get into a similar projects of how i build my portfolio small multifamily builds so i'm super excited that's awesome that's great what made you made, made you decide to jump into the realtor side well you know i've been thinking about it for a while and it's always been at the back of my mind but i was too afraid to make the jump like it's always been 
like it's not stable you know it's not a stable government paycheck that i'm getting now i'm um so fear was having me stuck but then diana you know i i saw that what was possible for me to build my real estate portfolio while still having a full-time job and i think that i'll be okay and i know that if i don't make the jump now and try at least try it i'm gonna regret it for the rest of my life so i'm going for it and i'm trying it and uh life is full of possibilities so i'm just taking it one day awesome. at a time I'm going full speed congratulations that's so exciting and yeah, you want to live life with no regrets and just try everything, figure out. I feel like it's also figuring out who you are, what you like. That's amazing. Let's get talking about the project. So what is this project that you want to share with us? Just give us a high level of what the strategy was behind it. And um, yeah, just what the strategy was. And just paint us a picture of what that property is so we can visualize the problems that happened afterwards. Too. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll paint some pictures for you. So um, this is a small multifamily build. What I'm talking about is a, a brand new eight units um, building in Edmonton. So it's a class A building and a class na A neighborhood. It's great. It attracts really good uh, tenant demographic. Um, so what's interesting is that the purchase price that we paid for it, um, this is a two year old purchase price because when you put the property like this under contract, um, by the time the property gets built, it gets appraised at a higher value. So um, it's more equity that you have in, 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 in the building, um, at least on paper. Um, uh, and so and um, basically, that? what's that? Sorry? So you purchased it, you purchased it or you signed it because this is a pre-built, right? It sounds yes. like it's a pre-built. So you're basically putting a property under a contract before it's built. You remove conditions and then it takes about 10 to 12 months to build. It gets appraised higher, but we purchased this property uh, January last year. So it's even like would be worth even more than that. So we purchased it for 1.9 million. These prices do not exist anymore. I'm just giving them for, you know, comparison purposes. And just to show you that in the time between we put it under contract and we appraised the building before it was completely finished, it was appraised at 2.26. Oh, wow. So like we, we like already built some equity um, on the buy. We, we made some money on the buy. Um, what else do you need to know uh, for this? We put CMHCMLI select financing on it. Um, yeah. And so, okay, so, you, uh, so it got reappraised. So that means you were able to then probably um, like not have to put any of your money in then because it was more than expected right i wish that's not how cmhc works <laughs> <laughs> yeah i wish um that would be extremely lucrative but the the good thing about these type of projects is that they qualify for uh, cmhc mli select funding where you can put down as low as five percent uh, um, your certificate of insurance that um, CMHC issues you will specify how much down you need to put. But basically, we put down into this property, um, I don't remember, I think between, I, I don't have the actual number um, in my head right now, but I, I feel like it was 6% maybe or 8 So for that much money down, we have an 8-unit building that's brand new mm -hmm. that will last mm -hmm. us for years and um attracts great tenant demographic because as you know a lot of risk in real estate comes from the type of tenant that you put in your property and are uh, being pretty happy with what we're getting mm -hmm. and i guess we might as well talk high level on the mortgages because i think also people are super interested to know for example this is a commercial mortgage and so what was your interest rate uh that you got for it <laughs> so our interest rate on this building is pretty good uh in comparison to today's standards it's uh, 4.3 <laughs> uh even though you know like 
today you can get maybe 4.5, 4.8. And as you know, like on a big asset like this, uh, that equates um, in, into dollar amount that even incremental changes, like it mm -hmm. means a lot of money mm -hmm. that you have to. Mm -hmm. So 4.3, um, I think it's pretty good. And this interest rate we have for five years. Uh, for the next five years, and then they'll have to be getting a new interest rate at five-year mark. Mm -hmm. And so, what what is your total expenses for the month? So, uh, for the months, what I will tell you is that um, maybe just to give you a little bit of context, how much income it generates, and then expenses. So, on a monthly basis, it generates around thirteen. Point five, so thirteen thousand five hundred per month. Um, uh, on average, expenses are close to eight thousand on a property like this. And then, of course, we put away money for, you know, um, repairs and maintenance. Even though this is a brand new property, we still budget for three percent and three percent vacancy. Mm -hmm. um, so, cash flow averages on a monthly basis like 1400 1500 uh, depends on the month depends on um what kind of expenses we have that month mm -hmm. um, yeah yeah that's amazing that's great and so now let's get to i think we've covered everything yeah we covered all the numbers now we have um the nice overview of what this project is and um, it's also, I think, this is actually a great example because it'll be nice to hear even in pre-construction type of projects, problems do come up. So let's hear what is what is a problem that came up while you were going through um, buying this property. So um, do you want one or do you want a few? Let's <laughs> so start with one and we'll discuss like... it and, we'll, and then we'll go through others. So okay. start with one so that we can kind of go through it and dissect it a bit. Sounds good. So maybe one, I'll, I'll start with something that most investors overlook when they get into a project like this. So basically what we have, it's an eight unit um, building, but it's a, a row for townhouses that are suited. There's up and down units for uh, an eight doors in total. So garages that we have are at the back of the property. Um, there is a back alley. And usually builders build these uh, garages as double car garage. So, which means, Diana, like, what does that mean? It means that just only one uh, of half of your tenants are getting a garage. And what is the other half of your tenants doing? <laughs> I mean, it can be okay because there's a ton of street parking. It's free. But on the convenience side, when you think as a tenant, um, you know, do you want to be parking on the street when it's minus 30 in Edmonton? Um, what if today you're parking here and tomorrow you have to like park somewhere else because somewhere else, some, someone else is parked in front of you or on your usual spot. So it just creates. Oh, I don't know if you guys are still here. Yeah, so I'm just thinking, um, I'm encouraging investors when they get into buildings like this to think as a user, as a tenant, and um, to increase, uh, enhance their experience and maybe even um, decrease the turnover, tenant turnover on your properties. Like think about subdividing those double car garages into single car garages, um, because then in I don't know if you knew that for all of those you, you folks uh, from Ontario and maybe other provinces where you can do that. But when we do that, we are able to charge, um, uh, you know, more more rent for garages. So garage becomes as a point an, an extra point of income for us. So, mm -hmm. you know, basic rent plus garage. Um, most of the time tenants ask to take the garage because people have cars and what we also do like thinking about from the user perspective we push those garages a little bit in and we extend the driveway so that tenants are able to park if they have two cars one in the garage and the other one on the driveway um, I love that very that is a great great point because something that people really you're right don't think about and can be just to a tenant, it can be very annoying. And like you said, it could make them leave or just create 
friction between each other is that whole parking and series. Um, if you're having to coordinate with tenants, if you have to go early in the morning and they accidentally park behind your who knows what and you didn't park in the right order, you know, people can really start getting irritated. So those kind of that kind of thought process of like you're saying, thinking about the tenant, because if you're thinking, what would I want if I were a tenant, you'll also help in reducing basically what you're saying, right? You're helping in reducing those problems for them and from there you have happier tenants you have more long if that's what you like more long-term tenants i personally like it yeah <laughs> so I, I don't i don't i don't i'm not one of those that likes to do turnovers every one or two years i'm like the longer the stay the less i have to worry about it it's less expensive for you right yeah when you decrease that turnover mm -hmm. yeah so i love that that's a that's a really great point and uh and uh, so that was something that you noticed in this project that, um, and you said though you divided, you you actually divided the garage. So does that mean you had two entrances in the garage? Yeah. Or, oh, you had two entrances. Okay. That's what and then, so this way your up and down tenant, every tenant has um, their own garage, their own space. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I can see now that you say that, I can see why you would even be able to charge extra because it's also their own storage space, garage, whatever. Because I was thinking, why not um, just leave it as two car garage, like together, they can at least each one, um, you know, go on each side and have one door as a common. But at the same time, like you said, if you can, if especially if you said it's an A plus neighborhood, you know that the money is there, that they're probably going to appreciate and want that, and they're probably willing to pay that. Why not for that area? So it's, it's a great option if it's available to you, like if it makes sense for the area you live in. So I love that idea, because I would have never thought, to be honest, to divide it out like that. Oh, and I think oh. she's uh, going, oh, there you are. <laughs> Sorry, just want, also wanted to add that uh, when you have a two-car garage, you on average can charge less than when you have two single car garages so it's more basically more income for you too exactly so worth considering yeah 100 percent. i would have definitely never thought to do that so i think that's an amazing tip that you give any other and i think that's not really was that really a problem or where was the problem in that that's more of a tip i feel so that's, like that's more of a tip yeah, yeah. and i have like other but if you want to like uh, think about the problem, so I'll jump into the problem right away. Mm -hmm. um, some people think that when they're purchasing new builds, um, there are barely any property inspection that they have to do at the possession. And that cannot be farther from the truth. Um, there are issues in new builds and um, I encourage people when they uh, take possession of properties like this to hire an independent third party uh, property inspector who can provide a whole uh, report on deficiencies and things that need to be looked at. So um, at our last build, we hired a property inspector like this. However, his uh, super scoping equipment wasn't working at the time. and. I was made aware of that. <laughs> I should have checked that. But I was made aware of that um, a month later when we had a massive sewer backup in our brand new Aplex. Oh, no. Where three units were affected. Oh, wow. So, because, uh, like, uh, anyhow, the good thing is that um, it was builder's fault. So the builder completely remediated. Um, they took care of the tenants, um, their hoteling cost. Um, they took care of the whole remediation and, you know, um, putting in new, everything you had to go in new. So, and they paid us rent. So on paper, we didn't have any vacancy. So it's like a blessing in disguise, but the units were vacant because they were renovating them. Mm -hmm. So that's probably I the biggest problem. even the stress to the tenants too, because who wants to like yeah. move out for a certain period of time kind of it's not the same as having your own place uh, and like you said especially that you know could have been something that could have been um like stopped if that inspection was done and i think that's also a great point that um having like you said your own inspector come in for a pre-con is so important because 
which I don't can't say that I really understand why, because city themselves are the inspectors and should be making sure they're there for the people. This is what I don't understand. They're there for the people, so they should be making sure that the buildings are good. But I guess, you know, like that, it's just come to a point where it's like you can't trust and it's like have your own independent one because you're paying them money and they're going to make sure that they have that report there for you. Exactly. They'll be very thorough. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's not mm-hmm. like the city. I don't expect the city to come when they do occupancy permit and uh, check the sewer, right? Um, do the scoping. There were walks in there. And mm-hmm. I mean, the builder built it with it really well and they were really apologetic about it. But it's still, like you said, inconvenient the tenants and also gave us so much heartache. <laughs> um, but no kidding. Because you're thinking the worst when it happens, you know, and you're like, you're, until you go through it, you're not, and even if it's the first time too, I feel like you're kind of like, what's going to happen, you know? <laughs> like, like yeah, how much money I'm going to take out of pocket? Like, is it covered? Because also you're kind of worried, are they going to make up some excuse saying it was my yeah. fault or who knows what? Like, I, I think everything goes through your mind, right? Yeah. So you just kind of, Dressed out like crazy because you're thinking, how many thousands of dollars am I gonna have to pay when I just bought this thing? You know, recently. Hundred no, percent, no, right? And that's why it, it becomes so important to work with um, like builders and other team members on your team um, that are vetted and that are thoroughly checked and that stand behind their work and uh, that you can trust when things like this come up they're not going to pin it on you but they're going to own it and they're going to take care of things and, and that's a very good point too yeah definitely making sure who your builder is is so important that yeah. i completely agree with you yeah it's also a very very great tip but yeah these are great tips you know like that people think that pre-constructions is something super easy and quick to do, but there are problems that can can definitely come up. Oh, any other, yeah. Any other ones? How is that the CMHC? Did you have any problems with with uh, getting that or delays? Or curious, curious to hear your opinion because um, you know you always hear different different things happening. Mm-hmm. You know, on that project, we didn't get any delays, even though we bought it right post COVID. So the builder was experiencing issues on their side. So the builder was running through some delays, but um, we still took possession on time and it was fine. CMHC was a bit backed up, but they came through. Um, Right now we are in the process of um, closing on another build, a 12 unit build just outside of Edmonton. And, applied for CMHC, thinking that they would be so backed up. So we applied a little bit earlier, especially we wanted to take advantage of the older rates before they raised them. They raised them in June last year. And lo and behold, I don't know why, but apparently like our application was maybe on top of the pile. <laughs> or maybe they liked that it was, you know, more than eight units. And <laughs> I don't know. So they picked it up pretty quickly and we got our COI pretty quickly. I think I would say by, we applied in June and we got it by October. It's oh, wow. Sure. And so that's like really quick for CMHC. And from what I'm hearing mm-hmm. now is that they hired a lot of agents and uh, they're doing really well. There's no backup. They're quick. Yes. And there's yeah, a housing I- shortage in the country. So they need to be quick, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. I think you're right. I've heard the same thing. So, you know, I feel like it's also sometimes with some people, I guess it's bad luck, you know, you get to a phase where you're stuck in that in between, where there was a stop, I think probably for about a year ish that things were just so stalled, Mm -hmm. where it's like, all of a sudden, you know, like now things now like that, all that extra hiring finally is helping out everyone just move, move everything along. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's amazing. And that's great that it went well. And actually, even to speak more on the CMHC side, just because I know that there's probably viewers that want to understand a little bit more about it. How does it, was it MLI, it was MLI Select, right? Yeah, MLI Select. So if you could just talk at a high level of how, you know, like what the process is like, because I know you have to do things like at the beginning and in the end. There's, there's like a process involved in it. Do you want to give us like a high level view of just how that came about and how that worked out? Yeah. 
So um, with CMHC MLS Select, I mean, I'm not a mortgage broker and I encourage people to chat with a mortgage broker who's done MLI Select um, deals before. Um, usually uh, the, you, you apply and because it says... Oh, I think uh, again, I got this, not disconnected, but we'll give her a minute to come back. Maybe it's not a good Wi-Fi. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I can hear you again. So where did you lose me? Uh, just you were just, just about to tell us that you're talking to a mortgage broker. Yeah, encourage people to talk to a mortgage broker because I'm not one, uh, but I can share my experiences and what we had to do. So because these are CMHC insured loans, um, Government, uh, government, CMHC still wants you to provide, which is government, uh, wants you to provide personal guarantees. Uh, but the good thing about them is that it's not you who qualifies for the mortgage, it's the property itself. You know, they look at the uh, CR, at the ratio, at the income the property is producing and qualify the property, the project itself, that it's viable, that it's going to sustain itself. But they're also looking at you as a borrower. So you need to show that you have your net worth is at least 25% of the project volume. And I mean, it's possible to achieve, if you are applying on your own, make sure that you have that, or you can bring a person who can show net worth and you just like, it would be a partnership then uh, project um, for you. Um, so that's the most part. Um, what, what, are there any checks and stuff? Like there's some, qualification or checks that they need to do right to like, uh, even just qualify that it or not 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 that stuff i mean checks on uh like the type of like the type of building or if it's affordability and all these different things oh, that you don't want, they do yeah. like inspections or something or for cmhc or checks so basically for mli select specifically there are three streams that you can apply uh, under there is affordability um, there is accessibility and there is environmental um, stream. So basically you are, um, you know, it depends on like what you, what stream you apply for. That's how you score points mm -hmm. and depends on how many points you score. You need to follow their guidelines or whatnot. We applied. So maybe what I can talk to is to affordability stream because that's what we used. Um, usually in, um, in Edmonton, the market is really affordable. So our affordability threshold is like 1600 something, 1636, I want to say. Um, and CMHC doesn't care if you assign, you know, a three bedroom or a basement one bedroom as affordable unit. They just want to see on new builds for you to qualify and to get 100% points under the affordability stream. You need to assign, uh, I believe it's 25% of your units or 20% of your units is affordable. So for an eight unit building, um, that meant two of our units have to be affordable. And it doesn't mean, like Diana, some people ask me, does it mean that, you know, there's like a label on my property now that it's affordable property, affordable unit, it, it doesn't mean that it's between you and your lender nobody else knows that one of the units or two of the units are affordable and basically what that means if you assign a unit um, as affordable um, your lender under CMHC COI that you get um, they're supposed to be checking your rent roll and other things once a year on your project and they have to they will be checking that affordable unit stays affordable and how much rent you are increasing so you are only allowed mm -hmm. to increase rent on those units um at this uh, cpi mark so uh, consumer pricing that that you get from stats canada tables and you that's how mm -hmm. you but so we so i'll give you an example this year we raised rents on our one bedroom unit that's designated as affordable by 13.5 percent and that's still within the threshold um, because it's still under um the um affordability threshold mm -hmm. so it's not yeah there and it's like because in alberta we can raise uh, rents at the market rate so that's still market rate and it's still below the affordability threshold set by the CMHC. Yeah, that's amazing. I just want to give a quick shout out to Get Social with yeah. Alex. <laughs> uh, love her. She's amazing. She's just giving us some compliments, telling us we're beautiful ladies. You are too. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, that's completely, uh, that's amazing that you can do that. And it's amazing even that it's only two of them that you have to do. Because I'm assuming probably four of them were for, or could probably fall under the affordability, but really you only had to put two of them. So if things were to change in the future, then those other two that are not under them and they happen to go higher, it doesn't matter. You're just maintaining those two. And they actually assign those 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 two units. Like you couldn't change things up for some reason if you wanted to. Like it's always unit A is that one, for example. It couldn't be like you re renovated or something. He's like, you know what? I want unit B to be be the one like that's going to be affordable. Can you switch it? Or it's specifically, do you have to maintain those two units that are assigned from the very beginning? And that's a great question. And I spoke. Uh, I talked to my mortgage broker specifically about this question and he told me you can switch things up as long as the new unit that you assigned is still affordable mm -hmm. so this is what you're saying so you, you i like that there is flexibility in that hopefully mm -hmm. that does not change because you know one thing you say today is one thing and tomorrow it's a different thing the same you see so. yeah <laughs> That's true too. You do have to be careful with those kind of things too. But it's just I'm thinking it's it's nice in the future where maybe something happens and you have to do a full renovation on one of the units. Then I feel like as an investor, you'd want well, might as well give the highest market rents for that one. And then maybe there's another one where you don't have to do renovations and you kind of re now relabel it if you can. Obviously, if you have that ability where it's the other one's vacant or something happens that you can have the two at the same time that you can like that swap, swap it or change it up. Yeah. And I like mm -hmm. that so far. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You just never know. I don't think though. I think, I think the chaos that happened now, I feel like, I think I'm hoping they're stabilizing now where at least for a while we won't see such crazy changes happen like we did last year two years ago now i think it was two years ago when that happened yeah yeah i still I feel that... like affordable housing is such a hot potato on the political and it's so politi politi politicized that i don't know what's gonna happen <laughs> like yeah, yeah. Know, that's policy. true too. actually that's a good that's a good point yeah it's all about yeah affordable housing so you're right it could there could be some changes Definitely, we always have to keep ourselves informed and aware of what's going on because we are investors and we do have to pivot at any moment and just kind of figure things out as they come. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Any other problems that you wanted to discuss that um, and share your insights on? You know, maybe one of the things that I wanted to mention is that even though this is a brand new build and uh, like. It's true. It's not like an, a Burr project. You're not, or you're not buying an older multifamily building that you have to renovate from top to bottom. And then like, you're not doing any of that. It's like more of a, you know, turnkey property that you're taking possession of. It's a great addition to any portfolio, I think, um, especially when you're thinking about diversifying. But like what pe a lot of people don't realize is that it's still you still as an investor, you need to be hands on on your property. So on a monthly basis, I recommend reviewing books, knowing how much, you know, utility you're paying. So, for example, right now, we are going through some utility overages, where it's like a lot. We are, so tenants are paying us utilities and then um, we are. So utilities are set up in our na uh, name because there is like one utility meter per townhouse. So if we don't keep track of those things, then we are in minus. So when tenants go over on their utilities, unfortunately, like we have to, you know, absorb the cost. Yeah. Or ask them to pay like the, what they are using over and above what they're paying us on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. now in tax, like you have to be extremely cautious with that as well. And um, I'm more thinking about your role as an investor, as an asset manager, uh, asset manager of a, of a property like this. You know, I have a property manager, so I don't do the property management work, but I work with my property manager to make decisions and to check over all the bills and uh, make sure that expenses, we keep expenses down. And it's my responsibility to shop around for quotes and rates. Um, 
um, and make sure we are getting the best deal possible. So what I wanted to tell investors is that even in a turnkey property like this, uh, you can't just sit back. It's still, you, you, you're still needed. Like you still have to be there. Maybe not on a daily basis, but you have to be there and do the work. If it's, um, maybe it's not you, maybe it's your working partner if you're just a financial partner on a project. Mm -hmm. But I completely agree. Having that awareness to what's going on in your projects is so important because you don't also want it to happen where you have no idea what's going on and then all of a sudden something happens and you think it's out of the blue, but it's really it's just been piling on, piling on, and you just haven't been paying attention. Uh, so I completely agree. That's a great, great advice to give to people because some people do have that mentality where it's just like, Oh, it's turnkey. I can close I my have eyes a to it. And, property manager, right? Or like I can just like even yeah, yeah like you said, yeah. even having exactly a property manager, and you think that they got it, but it's just like you have to be still. You're not doing all the work, but just having the eyes on it to just keep track of what's happening still has to be there for sure. And I wanted to ask actually one more question. You were talking about uh, just to get an understanding of it was in your agreement you have is it rent plus utility is is that what it's you it's yeah. rent plus utilities and you just uh take the money yeah um and then said oh, okay yeah. so it is e okay so i wasn't sure if maybe you guys have different rules over there where you can just tell them like hey pay me more money because oh, utility going out yeah, yeah, like so lucky yeah. we can't do that <laughs> because then you can provide your bills right and you know how much is um is in their uh, lease agreement how much they're paying and then how much they used over yeah mm -hmm. and actually also speaking of that because this is always an issue that i hear about i'm curious if you've experienced it or if you, even if you have any tips for it is like you said, one townhouse has two units and those two units are sharing a meter. Do you ever, have you ever experienced tenants, you know, blaming other tenants for the bills being high and like how, or, and how do you manage that? You know what? Not yet. If they've complained, they've complained to my property manager who has a lot of yeah, <laughs> but they're paying, so. Yeah. That's true, that's true. It, it, yeah. So, I mean, one of that's also, I think, one of the nice things of property managers, they can mitigate, you know. <laughs> they can offload that part. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, it's great to hear. Any last problems that you wanted to discuss, or did we cover all of them? I think we covered everything, and I'm happy to connect with um, investors, especially, you know, I, I think this is a great product for an out of province investor to look into. Mm -hmm. So if people want to connect and um, look at possibilities, I'm always open for it, to it. I love it. Yeah, it's thank you so much for coming on, Alona. If you guys loved what you heard, she's going to be tagged on here. So you'll be able to go and follow her and see what she's up to these days. And like she said, you can send her a DM. And if you guys love my shows, you guys want to see what I'm up to, same thing. Feel free to follow me, too, and see what I'm up to. And if you want to learn a little bit more about Alona, get into Refam, check out her profile. You can see what she, what properly I feel like she's up to. And I feel like Refam, you can actually have the profile, and it actually shows more detail of what is going on. I still need to fill that part out, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> But you have the profile and that's the yeah. portfolio. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Ilona. It was so much fun to chat Good with you. To connect with you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Ilona. Bye, everyone. We'll see you all in the next episode. Bye.